Okay, well, let, let's make a start. I think there, there may be a few more coming, but they can, they can wander in and uh, participate uh, as we go on. Thank you very much, everybody, for attending. Uh, my name is Peter Osborne. I currently chair the Community Relations Council, which I'm delighted to say is one of the sponsors of the Imagine Festival. I think it's one of the uh, premier festivals we have in this city, imagining <coughs> what democracy could look like, imagining and reimagining how civil society can be involved in uh, democracy and everything that is involved about democracy and participation in civic life, I suppose. And this year, the fifth year of the festival, there's about 150 events in the space of a week. Uh, incredible number of events uh, and an incredible variety of events as well happening all over the city, of which uh, this is one. Whenever you look at all of those events, uh, I can't believe how many fantastic speakers there are how many different people from all walks of life are coming and participating in roundtable discussions as well as lectures, as well as uh, all sorts of other ways, exploring how we can be more involved uh, in what democracy looks like in this part of the world. I'm delighted to say I think this lecture uh, is one of those speakers that has just excelled uh, in his public service and is one of the uh, speakers that, as I looked through the programme of events a few weeks ago, was one of those, one of those speakers that I wanted to come and hear uh, what he had to say. Um, Michael McGuire, Dr. Michael McGuire, uh, has been the police ombudsman here for the last seven years. He was appointed in 2012 and is due to finish his term very shortly in a few months in 2019. Michael, I don't know if you had hair when you started, uh, but I suspect that's part of the reason why it's all grey, what hair you have now. Uh, Michael also before that was uh, the Chief Inspector, uh, Prison Chief Inspector uh, for Criminal Justice. And before that he worked all over the world spending 18 years working in the private sector uh, and as a partner in PA consultancy. Uh, Michael is somebody who has just tremendous experience, not just of criminal justice issues here, therefore, but criminal justice issues all over the world. Uh, tremendous experience of what works well and what what doesn't work so well uh, around criminal justice. Tonight he's going to deliver a lecture on what does independence mean? A cautionary tale. Please welcome Dr. Michael McGuire. Thank you, Peter, and uh, thank you for coming out on this very nice uh, nearly summer's evening. Um, maybe you get a chance to walk home in, in, the, in the daylight and you'll still feel refreshed and wonderful after having heard me speak. Um, Thanks to Imagine Belfast for the opportunity to, to say a few words. This is probably the, the last public lecture I'll give uh, before I leave in July. So I've had the opportunity just to reflect on uh, the office, reflect on some of the issues that I think are important. What I want to talk about tonight is independence and what independence means in the context of not only the police ombudsman's office, but the the criminal justice system more generally, and indeed, maybe some lessons for other organizations across the, the Northern Ireland public sector. The perception and reality of independence is used as a, a measure of performance. And, and while it's, there are legal implications within the context of investigations, each criminal justice organization, whether it be the police, ourselves, the PPS, the judiciary, all guard their independence, uh, and rightly so. At one level, the topic is pretty straightforward. Uh, the, to quote the dictionary, free from outside control and not subject to another's authority. Thus, investigations are independent from political interference, prosecutorial decisions are taken on the basis of the evidence, and judgments are handed down without fear or favor. These are the things that we take for granted. Yet, it's an area of constant debate, perception and reality merging together often to form competing narratives about organizations and how they perform. And it's often the first line of attack uh, to my own office when we conclude our work. Uh, I do not believe an independent decision was taken. So independence can become the, the touchstone for much of the debate about the performance of an organization such as mine. So what I want to talk about is some reflections on the seven years as, as police ombudsman uh, and prior to that in, in my role as, as Chief Inspector of Criminal Justice. What are the areas to watch to ensure that independence, independence is not compromised? And it's interesting when I think back to when I joined the organization, certainly some of the issues I didn't see coming while others have been on a scale that I couldn't have uh, anticipated. 
So my starting point is what independence means in practice and how do you ensure it's maintained. And my conclusion, for what it's worth at this stage, is that we have, in terms of police oversight, some of the best safeguards in the world. But here's the beef. Independence is hard won and easily lost. It's a fragile thing. And it requires, in my view, constant protection, as it can be under threat from subtle and not so subtle attacks. You take it for granted at your peril. So where to begin? Uh, I want to take us away from Northern Ireland for a moment. Uh, there's a case in the Australian state of Victoria which caught my interest recently. It concerns allegations that Victoria police used a barrister as a paid informer to provide information on her clients. This has led to the establishment of a royal commission on the issue and the subsequent re revelation that a further six members of the legal profession were informers for the police. The work of the Royal Commission is ongoing. Now, you'll agree that this is a strange case which raises significant issues, not only about legal ethics, but also about the police attitude to the use of paid informers. The usual recruitment, the unusual recruitment, came, came at a time of gangland killings in Melbourne and significant pressure on the police to do something. We will be familiar with such a call. The police did indeed do something, including the recruitment of a defence barrister as an informant, and a high number of pro high-profile gangsters were convicted. A case of the end justifying the means, or as been put in another context, noble cause corruption as a justification. Now, however, it looks like these convictions might well be subject to challenge and possibly overturned, and confidence in the police has been severely damaged. This is only one of a number of controversial cases involving the Victoria Police, which have raised concerns about transparency, impartiality and the effectiveness of current police complaint handling and oversight arrangements. Prior to the barrister stroke and former scandal, the Parliament of Victoria established an inquiry into the external oversight of police corruption and misconduct in Victoria. So what, I hear you're thinking, what has that got to do with independence of the Police Ombudsman's Office? Well, what's interesting about what happened in Victoria is where they look to for solutions. Front and centre, believe it or not, has been the Office of the Police Ombudsman in Northern Ireland. I gave evidence to the committee, and in their report they note, and I'm quoting here, Pony is often regarded as the gold standard in complaints handling and oversight systems, an exemplary civilian control system. Professor Prenzler concluded that the office appears to have been successful and it remains the standout agency internationally. This, review, this view was reflected in much of the evidence to the committee received as part of this inquiry. So taking civilian oversight as the gold standard for handling complaints against the police, it is regarded that Pony is probably the only, and think about this in the context of Northern Ireland's place in the world, the only proper civilian oversight agency in the world that ticks enough boxes to be char characterised in that way. We have over overall control of the complaints process. We can make recommendations, publish reports, access information are all underpinned by legislation. These are areas, I can tell you, that others look, look forward to with envy and look on with envy. If, for example, you, uh, there's an investigation into the death caused by police in Australia and indeed the States, that is carried out by the police. In Northern Ireland, it is carried out by the Police Ombudsman's Office. If you make a complaint in England, Wales and Scotland, you have a 75% chance it will be investigated by another police officer. That is not the case here. It's investigated by my office. Now, the reason for the legislation, the reasons why uh, we have such strong uh, legislative framework here is you will not be surprised to learn is because of what has come out of the Northern Ireland Troubles. Policing in Northern Ireland was and continues to be a contested space. And the political reform of the Good Friday Agreement was in many respects underpinned by policing reform under Patton, and there was a strong desire to have the mechanisms of police accountability. The late Morris Hayes, who wrote the document establishment in the office, saw independence as the starting point for success. What he said was the, overall, the overwhelming message I got from nearly all sides and from all political parties was the need for the investigation to be independent and to be seen to be independent. 
the main value impressed on me was independence, independence, independence. So it's been a critical factor as to how the office has developed over the last 19 years. But as I've said earlier, these things cannot be taken for granted. Independence is a fragile thing which is hard won and easily lost. The challenge of independence comes from a number of sources, some subtle and some not so subtle. In thinking about these issues, there may be relevance for other public sector bodies that value their independent status. I wouldn't overstate it, but as we've seen with the RHI scandal and indeed other aspects of public services in Northern Ireland, oversight, accountability remains a strong area for concern. And in my view, maintaining an independent perspective, both in, in, in practice and in reality, is an important dimension to avoiding how oversight bodies can be seen to be asleep at the wheel. So what lessons can be learned from the Office of the Police Ombudsman? And I think there are three areas for discussion um, based on some academic work in this area by a professor in Sussex and I've applied them to my own context. First of all, financial independence. Now it's often said that he who pays the piper calls the tune. How can you truly say you're independent when the purse strings are held by someone else? Clearly, there are legislative protections here which underpin certainly our investigative practice in the office. And in my 11 years of leading criminal justice oversight bodies, I cannot think of one example where a minister has tried to influence decision making. Any minister with responsibility for police oversight would be extremely foolish to try and interfere with the decision making and in my experience has never done so. My experience as civil servants has also been positive. In the vast majority of cases they have acted professionally and with a correct understanding of the relationship between the sponsor department and the oversight body. Very occasionally there have been attempts which have overstepped the mark. As an aside, and I wouldn't overstate this, but I do remember under direct rule wanting to brief the then minister uh, without his civil servants present about a sensitive topic on prisons. It was by pure coincidence that a senior civil servant in the sponsor department initiated a conversation about the fact that my contract was coming to an end. And could they have a conversation with me about it? Now, examples like that have been few and far between. And it's pretty mild and I have to say easily batted away. I do wonder though if this has been an issue for other oversight bodies that produce a report that might embarrass a minister of the department. Anecdotes I've heard would suggest that perhaps there are issues uh, that need to be considered in that context. Because what it can lead to is self-censorship and the dilution of difficult but nonetheless necessary messages. Yet, as we know, funding is a political decision. All politicians in power have to make difficult decisions about competing priorities. And here the challenge is one of ensuring that the necessary funding is provided to undertake the work. We all want funding for our own organisations and decisions on prioritisation clearly have to be made. Now, if we take my legacy investigations as a case in point, in 2012 when I was appointed I had 170 complaints with around 40 staff. Today I have an excess of 430 complaints and around less than 30 staff doing legacy investigations. But let me be very clear, I am not saying there's been some form of conspiracy to underfund the office to undermine its ability to investigate the past. I'm not saying that, although there are some who would argue that that's the case. The budget cuts face in the office have been part of a general austerity drive across the public sector, and certain areas have suffered, and in certain areas we have suffered less than others. But it is perhaps an unintended consequence of the failure to fund legacy that has forced the office to prioritize which legacy cases it can work on, and thus independence of decision making can be compromised because we don't have control of the budget. The impact of having to do more with less is a constant refrain across the public sector, but it becomes dangerous when it directly impacts on what cases can be investigated and how long these investigations take. I've said in other contexts, I'm genuinely tired of having to apologize to families for the length of time that cases take within the office. And I recognize that this pales in insignificance compared to the impact on those who've had to wait many years for answers to what happened. But an independent office needs to have the resources, the skills and the procedures to provide 
an independent complaint service. Which brings me to my second area. There's a Chinese proverb that concerns the boiling of a frog. Placing a frog in boiling water means it will jump out. Placing a frog in cold water and gradually turning up the heat will mean that the frog will be cooked. This rather gruesome image is often presented as demonstrating the dangers of slow incremental change. By the time you realize it, dramatic change, by the time you realize it's dramatic change, it's too late to do anything about it. This is an area that any oversight body has to be constantly aware of. Such challenges are presented in the language of managerialism. The need for greatest, greater efficiencies mean that accommodation has to be shared. Capital budgets have to be controlled. HR practices have to be centralized. We're constantly being asked to ensure policies and procedures are consistent with the Northern Ireland Civil Service and to participate in central initiatives. So what? Well, the so what is the problem that Pony, my own organization, is an investigative body with its own culture at the ethos based around the principles of civilian oversight. The distinctiveness and clarity and purpose and the capacity for flexibility in what we do has made a significant contribution to building the office in the last 19 years. The more an office like Pony becomes integrated within central initiatives, the less distinctive it becomes, not only in the minds who work for it, but for those to whom we provide a service. Allowed to work their course unchallenged, an organization can be very different in five or 10 years time compared to what it is now. For example, the freedom to make recruitment decisions is critical. We have seen elsewhere the risks of what's called regulatory capture, where an organization, which occurs when an agency has been created to act in the public interest, advances instead the concerns of the industry or sector it is charged with regulating. Such a position can occur if there's too much movement between the oversight body and the organization responsible for it. One of the worst examples I can think of of this was found in the RAN report in the Republic of Ireland, published a number of years ago, into sexual abuse of children in schools. What he says is that the education inspectorate was basically captured by the religious, the schools, and the Department of Education, and as a consequence, significantly failed in their duty of care to children. And it's often said as an argument in support of this kind of movement that only professionals can oversee or regulate other professionals. So that lawyers must examine lawyers, doctors must examine doctors, teachers must inspect teachers, and so on. It's only recently that Her Majesty's Inspector of Constabulary recruited senior inspectors who were not police officers. I believe it's one of the strengths of civilian oversight in an organization such as Pony, is that we have a mix of people drawn from a variety of different backgrounds. Don't get me wrong, I do have a need for ex-police officers as part of my organization, but the culture and ethos should be our own. It shouldn't be one which simply reflects policing. Because perception is important as well as reality. And I think there are lessons to be learned from other jurisdictions. And I note that the police oversight bodies in Scotland and England and Wales prohibit a police officer from holding the top post. So independence is not just therefore about decision making. The organizational context that decisions are made are critically important. Finance does determine when cases can be investigated and how long that investigation takes. Recruitment procedures do determine the nature and type of organization. Accommodation does influence the character and ethos. And while we can make an argument that our funding is not derived from the police, it's difficult to say it can be spent with complete discretion within the office. Clearly, there cannot be complete autonomy. A minister under the devolution, if you remember that, has to be accountable to the executive for the budget spend within the office. No minister would, as I've said, involve themselves in decision making around cases, yet the context and framework within which these decisions are taken fall within his or her decision making. Which takes me to my third area then, the final one over which we have most control is independent judgment, or put it another way, independent decision making. It's also perversely the area of greatest challenge. For some people, a good ombudsman's report is like a good exam question. It's one you know the answer to. And all too often, if you don't like the answer, you don't like the report. Northern Ireland has many public bodies which provide 
an independent service, but very few which hold our authorities to count and do so in public. Two that spring to mind are the National Northern Ireland Audit Office and the Northern Ireland Public Services Ombudsman. But it would be fair to say that neither has been in the eye of the storm the way in which the Police Ombudsman's Office has been since it opened 19 years ago. One of my colleagues who has served in the office for, that, for, for these 19 years recently remarked to me that it has always had to fight for its independence. But that fight is now more intense and frequent than it has ever been. Certainly there are times when it's felt we were under attack, whether it was from a lack of funding, the judicial process, judicial reviews, elements of a hostile media set against everything that we do. The ability to cherry pick reports, to focus on ones you disagree with, while ignoring the ones you like, or the other way around, has taken on an art form. Thus we are accused of being obsessed with the term collusion. Those who say this obviously have not taken the time to look at the work that we do. Of the 14 legacy reports we've published, we find no evidence of collusion in, in, in 11 of them, hardly an obsession. We're accused of grandstanding, of hogging the headlines of a witch hunt against police officers, focusing on what has gone wrong, that we don't understand policing. Again, I would say the evidence doesn't stack up. We find an outcome in favor of a complainant in around 30% of cases, which is high internationally. But put it another way, we do not substantiate a complaint in around 70% of the cases that we look at. We publish around 50 case studies a year. If you're bothered to read them, you will see there's a real balance of both criticizing the police and showing them and, and showing that they did no wrong. Hardly a witch hunt. To those I, that say to us, we don't understand policing, I'm afraid I have to say you don't understand police accountability. A finding by my office that said the police did no wrong is as valuable as one which says the police activities fell below the standards expected. Yes, we've been very critical of the police and in a very public way. There have also been times when we've addressed serious allegations of police criminality and misconduct and determined there was no substance to those allegations. That these conclusions have hardly gone, have largely gone unchallenged, I would argue is because we have not been afraid to publicly criticize the police when it's been necessary and appropriate to do so. That is accountability in my view and practice. It is of course right, it is of course right that reports to the office are subject to public scrutiny. Transparency is an important part of demonstrating independence. And the power to publish one particular report is currently under challenge in the courts, so I'll not say anything more about it at this stage. But challenge becomes dangerous to independence when it's weaponized when attempts are made to under, undermine everything you do because you dislike some things. Before I became police ombudsman in 2012, I actually took an, an investigation into the independence of the office of Chief Inspector of Criminal Justice. It seems a long time ago now. Certainly many of the issues considered important then have now been thankfully taken off the table. And this is in no part, no large part due to the staff work within the office itself. At the time, I said operational independence of the office had been lowered, partly because its reports appeared to have been buffeted from a number of different directions, which led to a lack of confidence amongst many of those involved in the process. It's ironic that the office, which has been lauded as having the most robust legislation and independence and control of the complaints process, would be criticised in 2011 for independence of judgment. So I suppose this takes me to the critical lesson that I've learned during my time in office. The need for an independent mindset, which is evidence-based and which resists the pressures for taking unpopular views. You can have all the safeguards you want, but if an independent mindset is not there and you're reluctant to say difficult things, then there's a problem. So what's the conclusion? First of all, the obvious one is that you cannot take independence for granted. It can be undermined in a number of different ways, and whoever holds the post of police ombudsman must keep this in mind. Be aware that some entirely innocent initiatives can have unintended consequences. Secondly, it's not enough to be aware, you have to take action. You need to be a thorn in the side of those you are holding to account and who have the power to influence what you do. This should not be destructive, but protect the office and what it does. Society in general, and policing in particular, will benefit from strong evidence-based opinions freely given. Finally, and most importantly, independence of judgment is the key. 
An independent mindset and perspective, in my view, are essential. That's why we're seldom away from the headlines. The Northern Ireland population are not fools. If you want people to accept that you're independent, then you have to provide them with the evidence and let them make up their own mind. Thank you. Michael, can I uh, say a couple of things as, as we close? Uh, first of all, for, for, for what it's worth coming from me, and I suspect coming from everybody here, can I thank you for your public service over the last number of years, but especially the last seven years as a policing ombudsman. One of the most difficult tasks I think there is here, uh, one of the tasks where the integrity of the person doing it is really extremely important. And I think over anything I've seen over the last seven years, nobody has questioned that integrity. And I think you've contributed hugely to this society. And so can I ask everybody to join me in saying thank you very much to Dr. Michael McGuire. <laughs>